if you want to be known for something, then it takes the consumer an average of seven times before they believe it. Welcome to The Grant Wise Show. This podcast helps ordinary real estate agents build extraordinary companies. Let's grow in three, two, What's up, everybody? Grant Wise here, and I have a very exciting guest today. Another wise guy. I got uh oh, Buck Wise has joined me in the studio. Buck is an incredible entrepreneur. He is currently the CEO of Closing Day Agency. He does some incredible work, and I'll let him tell you a little bit more about that. But he got a start back in the day with the iHeart Broadcast. He's been on with guys like Ryan Seacrest. He's built and sold multiple agencies. He's worked with clients like Nike, Starbucks, and Google, as well as real estate industry icons, Grant Cardone, Ryan Serhant, Glenn Sanford. And I am honored that he's agreed to spend a few minutes with us here today in the podcast. So Buck, man, thanks for being on the show. Grant, I appreciate it's finally finally a time that you invite your relative, your brother to the podcast. <laughs> you know, our, we have the yeah. same mother, different fathers. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I I don't meet many wises. It's very interesting that, that, do you know the background of wise and where it comes from? Man, I do not. It's like Irish Scottish. It's like, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like some of the heritage. Yeah. It's like a mutt kind of in a weird way. But it totally is surprisingly like a lot of heritage in like the UK. Yes. It's very interesting. Yeah. So I like, I, I definitely, I got into that genealogy thing. My grandmother wanted me to know more about my heritage one year. So nice. I've studied it a little bit. Very cool. That's why I've always felt this like connection to like, I want to go to London. I want to go like, I, I want to go to Ireland. Yeah. Well, I was in London. I, I actually worked for an agency in London. And, uh, and so I went back to my motherland for a little bit, got some fish and chips. <laughs> well, uh, okay. So back to the show. You have such an impressive background in this space. And, and I met you years ago when you were working with Grant Cardone. That was kind of my first introduction to you. And I think you were doing some great things with him. You've just built like a number of extraordinary companies. And so I, I know it probably wasn't always like that, but give us the backstory of Buck. Like just tell us, you know, really quickly, how, how did you get to where you are today? Yeah. I, I think people for the most part don't really care about other people's LinkedIn profile and they want you to go through all these amazing careers you've had. So I try to take my background and I try to use it as a learning lesson for people and how I was able to figure out how to create businesses, scale them, create more revenue, drive more leads, and then you know, eventually exit or sell them. And so I started on the creative side. I was at iHeartRadio for 15 years. I got into syndicated radio. I worked with Ryan Seacrest before Idol. He wasn't very famous, but he and I had a show together over 45 markets syndicated. And so, you know, I, I very much was a middle child and I loved the attention. I loved the content creation. What I learned though in those years was how to build a community, how to create content that actually resonates and connects with people. Not just saying, hey, I'm creative for, I have a really good idea, this might work. But like, how do you actually build an audience that's loyal and that when you give a call to action, you actually evoke a behavior that drives them to make a decision. And that's what I really picked up in my iHeart years, what I didn't know then. And what I didn't even care to know, I was not one of those guys that was like, I'm going to own a business, I'm going to be a mega millionaire. Like I was like, I got a good job. I'm 20 years old doing six figures, bro. My family is filled with teachers and preachers. And I was like, I'm making six figures at 20 years old. Psh, I'm good, you know? So like, I didn't have that entrepreneurial spirit when I first started. And I think a lot of that, and I don't know, Grant, about your background, but, you know, uh, a lot of people that's, that are watching this or listening to this right now, I didn't have financial literacy as a kid. So I didn't understand what freedom or wealth or, you know, cash flow. I didn't understand any of those things. And it wasn't until midway through my career, I started to build businesses, but, but, I'm glad I learned the creative aspect at iHeart because it taught me how to build my first marketing agency. And it was built out of necessity. Everybody's like, how did you get, you know, my first client was Major League Baseball. 22 years old, Detroit, Michigan. And they're like, how do you not want to start a business? And I'll tell you how I did it. This is how I accidentally, an accidental entrepreneur. This is how I did it. I was inquisitive in nature. And this Zuckerberg guy created a college-only platform where you had to go on and have a college email. And I was like, I, I don't have a college email, but I'm going to figure out how to get in this thing, right? And I wanted to be a part of that, that network online. I was already building networks in broadcast and traditional media, 
But I was like, I got to figure out how to like bridge the gap. I think traditional media in the beginning was really bad. They were really bad at um, making the connection between digital and physical. So I got really good at it. So good that the Detroit Tigers came to CBS, which is where I was employed. I was um, doing a morning show for CBS and I was running digital for uh, a, a handful of TV and radio stations. And the Tigers basically came to us and they said, we're a 145 year old brand. And we don't have a buck. And they said, could we just pay you to come build a strategy? And I looked over at my market manager and I'm like, like a consultant? Like I do a radio show and I work for CBS. You want me to just come to the office after hours and like build out a plan of like how to get more season tickets and how to, and they were like, yeah, like what, what do we post? How do we post it? And there were no social experts at that time, by the way. Nobody knew what was going. We were all making it up as we went along. And I was just the guy that was the most inquisitive. So that's how I landed my first client. And then I hired people. And then I got five more clients and then 10. And then eventually one day I had to make the decision, traditional or digital. And traditional is you've watched the numbers and revenue. They continue to just go down. And so digital was going up. And so I stepped out of traditional, went full on into digital created my first agency, sold it to my business partner, and then moved into a smaller agency and got an equity deal where we scaled it and, and sold it to the world's largest holding company, WPP. Um, and then worked with a lot of really big brands like Starbucks and Nike, Google. I've got stories for days of amazing beta projects from Google that never saw the day of light or they did see the day of light, but I've worked on them for six months before they ever came out. Nike running for two years, Starbucks, Frappuccino, Pumpkin Spice Latte, Via, like all kinds of fun products. But, you know, I think it's important. There's a distinction and people, they always get like a little nervous when they hear me. I used to think it was cool to be like, I've done marketing for Starbucks. And 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 what I found is it, it's turn, it turns off most entrepreneurs because they're like, I don't have a million dollar budget and whatever you were doing there, I know isn't going to freaking help me at all. So like, I think it's important to know I was working with gas stations when I owned my first agency on like, how do we get 10 more customers a day through the door? So like, I, I do get the ground and pound small business. I was a startup. I had to hire my first person, fire my first person. I had to like figure out how to do taxes and realize I didn't have as much money as I thought I did. You know, like I did, I went through all the same mistakes and shit that every other entrepreneur goes through, but I did, I got to learn all of that at scale with better processes and amazing technology and uh, crazy recruiting efforts. And, you know, it was just the world's top talent. I got to work alongside amazing people. So I take a lot of that knowledge back to me and back with me with smaller entrepreneurs and I help them just bust ass to become better personal brands online. So that's it in a nutshell, Grant. That's the whole, you got the whole legacy there. And I should say, I own an agency now called Closing Day Agency. This is my vice president, by the way. This is Jacqueline. Say hi, Jacqueline. Hi, Grant. Nice to meet you. Hey, Jacqueline. It's good to meet you as well. Jacqueline, she manages client success. So every day we're building personal brands. We're building content creation, Instagram, TikTok. She's the expert on all these platforms. She's viral. Every day she goes viral. And so... And so closing day agency is what I'm running now. And we got a big team out of Scottsdale, Arizona, and we've got clients from where? Dubai. I mean, we're worldwide. Mexico, <laughs> Canada. Mexico, Canada. Yeah. yeah By the way, I want you to know, Grant is not related to me. I thought you should know that really quick. <laughs> I just saw that. Yeah. <laughs> Wise. <laughs> we were talking a couple of days ago and you were talking about where you all really focus like prioritize and focus your time and attention can you talk about that a little bit like what are you really helping the the real estate agent today or the team leader or the brokerage like where are you helping brands today yeah i, I would say the biggest challenge is a lot of agents are just creating but they don't have intention in what they're doing and when you're not organized there's always failure and so we bring a lot of organization comfort strategy. Just strategy, basically. You know, it's like, who are you? Understanding your value propositions, understanding your attributes, knowing the filters of content or pillars of content. Knowing your target. Know the persona, that. the target, the avatar. Like they, they just, they think they know, they have a slight idea, but it's like, guys, let's do the work. Let's do the research because we're in this for the next 10 years. We're not in this for the next 10 months. And, and that is the stat. Real estate agents 
most, I think it's 80% or 90%, some high number bail out in less than 10 months. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're always trying to get people to fortify and go for the long run and not just try to get a quick win because you'll never win that way. And you can tell who's investing in strategy and who's not with two comments or three comments. hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and let's talk about this for a second. Cause I think this is a, something that a lot of aspiring agents, team leaders, which is primarily people listening to this don't do is they do not spend hardly any time on something you just mentioned, which was their avatar. And as a, fa as a matter of fact, like a lot of them are even afraid to, like, I don't want to limit myself as the thought process, but walk us through why that's not the case. Yeah. You know, I think that there's so many different avenues we could take here, but the one that's most important is a quote that I love and it's to know me is to love me. And so people think, you know, oh, I shower somebody with gifts and they feel loved. No, people feel loved when they feel understood and heard. And so when I see a real estate agent and I see it every single day, sometimes it's, it, she knows this, I have to bite my lip because I just want to say something, but it can come off wrong. Like you're just like trolling or insulting real estate agents. I don't want to do that, but I want to just go, ah, like I want to help. I want to help. But when you hear them go, Hey, if you're looking to buy, you're looking to sell, you're looking to invest, maybe you're single family, maybe you're looking for corporate spaces. It doesn't matter. I'm the real estate agent that can do it all. To know me is to love me. Like clearly, I know immediately when an agent goes wide, I call it going wide. When an agent goes wide, they have no idea who their consumer is. And that message of I'll do anything for anyone doesn't resonate with anyone, doesn't make a connection, doesn't build authority, doesn't create trust. And so that's like at a high level, like, you got to get niche and you got to understand the challenges of that one avatar or consumer. And so you got to speak a language that, that already makes sense to them. And that's why I say spend time to really dial in on who that is. And then don't create conversations that they don't want to be a part of. Join the ones that they're already having because too many people are talking at someone instead of with someone. And so that's what we help them do. Yeah, that's. A, I think it's a great distinction. I've I've told people for years the person that works with everyone works with no one, and so you can't, you know, sit back and and say like I'll, I'll work with everybody. I mean, you can. It's just like you're really you're really restricting yourself. But you said something a second ago. You said too many people are talking at their audiences instead of just joining the conversations that they're already having. What do you mean by that? How how can an agent like if I'm an agent listening to this, I'm like, okay, well, how do I know what they're talking about? Where do I find these conversations? How do I participate? Yeah, really good question, Grant. And I like that you did this. Oh, bye, Jacqueline. There goes Jacqueline. I like that you asked that question because it reminds me of spending six months and millions of dollars building the persona, the avatar, the exact consumer, of the pumpkin spice latte. So Howard Schultz came to us and he said, we have a challenge. Dunkin' Donuts, McDonald's, Yankee Candle, Durex Condom, like all these brands have a pumpkin spice something. And... We are no longer the original pumpkin spice flavor. And so he gave us six months and a budget, a big budget to do the research, to learn what is the behavior of the core persona. And the reason we want to know the core persona is because there's peripheral, you know, there's some people that drink a pumpkin spice once, they never drink it again. They're not going to drive an impact on revenue. The person who's loyal and it has repeat occasions of drinking as the one that's going to drive the most revenue. So we don't care about Bob, who's 62 years old and says, oh, I'll try it, but it was a little too sweet. I just like my black coffee. Like we don't focus on that. You know, so so when I when I talk about having conversations with people instead of talking at them, we could easily say, here are three reasons the pumpkin spice latte is the best beverage this fall. One value prop, two value prop, three value prop. Here's why you should buy this drink. Three reasons you should buy this drink. That's talking at someone. What we learned about Heather, and that's her internal code name, what we learned about Heather is that it isn't even the flavor of the beverage. And here we would be just saying it tastes better than any other coffee, pumpkin spice beverage, right? We'd be selling her, talking at her with something that doesn't even make sense. The thing that, that Heather wanted more than anything was to be a micro influence within her own peer group. 
The thing that Heather wanted more than anything was to be the first to know that it existed. And the thing that Heather wanted more than anything was to document the process of drinking that beverage, sharing it with her friends and saying, falls backs, bitch, you know, like having her Instagram blow up. And by the way, she's Gen Z, so she's not really even millennial at this point, but she doesn't even want to be an influencer. She wants to be in her little group. She wants to be the one that always informs the rest of her, her peer group. And so what did we do instead of talking at her and talking with her and joining her on a level where she was more interested? We gave Heather, we call it's called dark posting, where you only share these posts with people who fit this exact persona and avatar. We learned so much about the fact that she buys Ugg boots, but they were from last season because she's frugal, because she has college debt, and she lives in an apartment, mostly metro. Like We learned so much that we could only target this person. And, and when we did that, our messaging to her was, this beverage is not available to the general public, but if you use this code word, this secret code word, you can have access to the beverage three weeks before anyone else because you are a loyal pumpkin spice latte fan and we're going to give you access to it before anyone even knows that it's launched. We had a 20% increase in sales from the year before. 20% increase in sales from the year before. Before the beverage even launched to the general public, we made more money without any mainstream advertising. By niching, dark posting, and targeting the persona, we made more money than selling to the masses from the year before. And so, and so that's the important part of talking with someone, not at someone, and understanding them so intimately that you know what they really want. And that data point isn't necessarily the value of your product or service. It could just be an internal feeling that we want them to have. But if you're not talking to your customer, by the way, a lot of people say, I'm not Starbucks. I don't have six months and millions of dollars. That's just an excuse because you know what you have is customers. You have done this before. Even if you're new, you've at least sold your cousin or your brother's condo or you've done something, right? Like go have conversations about what really matters to the target. Go find the ideal avatars. And if you are established, if you've been doing this 10 years, 15 years, then you really have data. Go backwards and look at who drove the biggest impact on your revenue and start doing study groups. Start having Zoom calls or free luncheons. You know, give some value where you're giving away information to whatever your target's interests are, but then ask them questions uh, in the process. The other thing I'll say is as you scale out your efforts, put a process in place today to capture this data and information about your target as you grow so you don't have to go backwards after the deal is done in the in the relationship where in the relationship is there a process to ask the right questions and here's why we worked on a campaign with adidas where we studied millennials who at the time this was years ago at the time they were not decision makers and had no finances but they wanted to know how they made decisions and how they were going to make decisions once they were able to create decisions and make cash on their own. And so the, the, the Heather I talked about for Starbucks is now married with kids, but we know that she still shops at Target. Why? Because there's a Starbucks and a Target, right? And does she, she still loves pumpkin spice, but she does not drink it as much as today's Heather would. The Heather I worked on nine years ago, eight years ago, she drinks one because she's weight conscious and she's older with kids and she's still trying to keep off the baby weight. If I don't continually understand who my avatar is, it shifts. The market shifts. The dynamics shift. The relationship shift. They, they move out of ideas. The technology changes. Things move and shift. So it isn't just learn it and once you've documented it, like now we're good to go and that's the Bible. No, you got to have a process in place to always understand intimately. And that's how you stay ahead of competitors is just constantly studying the data. So that was a long answer for a simple question, but I thought it was a, a, good, a good question, Grant. Well, I think it is a simple answer. I mean, not, not that it wasn't like fantastic. I mean, the, the level of insights that you talk about having with your avatar is, I, I just maybe even argue maybe it wasn't even enough. Like maybe we could have heard more about Heather, right? Because agents are so afraid of this. They can be so afraid of this. 
uh, because in their mind, they're saying like, well, that's only one person. I want to work with a thousand people. And it doesn't always click. Like, well, no, the, the way that you work with a thousand people is is by understanding who your avatar is. Because the, the reality is, is there's many of these people out in your local marketplace, whether you're trying to to sell more houses, whether you're trying to recruit more agents. Um, and so I love, 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 love the answer and the insight. Because I think it's so powerful. You hit on something really, you hit on something really important though. And Grant, I would expect that from you because I know you understand it. But a lot of times people think of marketing or advertising. They don't even know the definition, branding, advertising, marketing. They don't know what it means. But they think of what we do as money. They think of it as this, Legion. We're just trying to make more of this, right? The truth is, it's about connection. And you mentioned the word recruiting. I have entrepreneurs that work with me that are so focused on the recruiting effort because they know they can't scale or grow unless they're marketing to attract and, and acquire and magnetize amazing new talent. They're never going to get big. They're never going to grow. So like marketing is not just buy my product, my service, give me money, spend grant, right? Grant and I might build something together. Grant knows something I don't know. I know something he doesn't know. We might end up building something. Together. I don't need to recruit him. He doesn't need to buy my product. But my marketing effort, somehow, Grant was attracted to it. He said, this guy's interesting enough. He said, come on my podcast. I come on. We share value in something. You see what I'm saying? People are so damn transactional. Like marketing is just like tell stories, evoke an emotion, make a connection, earn trust, and then figure out what you're going to do from there. It could be sometimes I spend money. I might end up spending money and buying Grant's product. I, I, I don't know. But the idea is this. You won't know if you don't try and you don't start today attracting human beings into your ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And today, I mean, if you're listening to this today, it's never been more important than ever because the perception in the real estate industry is not great. You have these lawsuits shaking out and no matter where you turn, you find agents talking about their production, uh, kind of talking at the audience like you're talking about. And I've, I mentioned this on a couple of podcasts ago. I was interviewing James Wiggins and Keith Robinson, the guys over at Next Home is, you know, when you put out content talking about your production, you're not attracting the people that you think that you are. Like that's not really attractive in any way, shape or form to the buyer or seller who typically equate real estate agents to used car salesmen. And I'm not trying to um, upset anybody, but sometimes the truth is upsetting. What should an agent do in their marketing to truly attract people and this is more of a leading question. So I'm going to actually go back to like, how can the agent tell more stories to help alter public perception of who they are in the local marketplace and put the customer at the forefront of their business instead of talking about, well, this is how I sold this house in seven days for over asking. Like, that's not a story. That's kind of like what I'm understanding you're saying is like, that's talking at somebody. That's just telling people what you did, not necessarily sharing or letting people share in the experience that your clients got to have? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. I think I have a good answer for it. It might make sense. Tell me if I'm going the right way. I believe that in marketing, perception is reality. And so the number one thing I hear from most real estate agents who made it past the 10 month mark, like I don't need to get on TikTok and do crazy stuff and tell stories, open up, get personal. I've got amazing retention. You know, I just people, I meet people, I go to events, I go to happy hour. Here's the truth. Perception is reality. If you're not online, then anybody who would do business with you, if they're checking for credibility, if they're, if they're new and they don't know who you are, if you're not online, they believe you don't exist. They believe that you're bankrupt, right? And so the first thing is, if you want to be known for something, then it takes the consumer an average of seven times before they believe it. That's all industries, a very broad number. But we use that number broadly as a starting point. The average consumer doesn't really listen until they've heard it seven times. I'm Buck and I help entrepreneurs build better personal brands. I'm Buck and I help entrepreneurs build better personal brands. Seven times someone needs to hear that to go, who's that personal brand guy? The with the weird name sounds like a cowboy, uh, but oh, it rhymes with the F word. Yeah, Buck, that guy, right? Like you got to get attention and awareness, and and the marketplace is so crowded. 
Grant's going to post a clip from this. I'm going to post a clip from something else. Grant Cardone's posting clips. Ryan Serhant's posting clips. And it's just blah, 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 blah. So the average attention span of most consumers is two seconds. One, two, one, two, one, two. So you got to be able to, one, stay consistent, two, cut through, and three, understand that what you talk about is what you become. So I don't know if this answers the question, but essentially – if you want to attract the right people, this is John Maxwell. If you ever know, you know, John Maxwell, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Business, great book. Um, he talks about law of magnetism. And that is you get back what you put out. So if you think about your content today, your storytelling, what you're creating, that is what you are going to get back. And, and so be intentional about who you are and be specific. I hope that answers the question. I think it's a great answer, man. I I um I love where you tied it in with Maxwell. You you're gonna get back what you put out there. I think that's like the essence of what we're saying here is that you're in a time period as a real estate agent where you're going through disruption, you're going through legal things that you don't really want to be in the middle of. And you've got to be able to communicate not only that you're not a used car salesman, like but you've got to be able to communicate your value proposition because the industry is going through change over the course of the next one, two, three, four, five years. And if you cannot articulate, especially if you're a buyer's agent, the value that you provide to the marketplace, it's going to be very difficult for you to have the level of success that you ultimately want to have. And so I love the message because I think it's spot on. You're going to get back to put out. I'll leave you with this, Grant, because I got to pop into a meeting here with a client in person. But I'm going to leave you with this. If you can't articulate in less than one sentence why you exist, how you're different, the purpose you serve for the consumer, and what pillars of or what attributes, when I say attributes, the feeling that you want the consumer to have when they talk to you, those are attributes. If you can't clearly and distinctly say that online, like you already know, because I've said it three times, I owe you like five more. Like I help entrepreneurs, coaches, CEOs build better personal brands online. If you can't articulate how I'm able to save people time, get them better results. If you can't articulate that in a way that is compelling and understood, then how the hell do you expect them to understand? How the hell do you expect the consumer to understand what, what problems you're going to solve if you can't clearly articulate it and you haven't done the research to know if that's actually what they need in the first place? You know, it's funny too, because I'm standing here pretending to be the expert. And when I built my business, this third agency around personal brand, I didn't do enough research and something we found the first year in is, yes, they want to be saved more time and they want better results. But you know what the third value proposition was that we never created, never even thought about. And the feedback loop, the data said, Buck, this is actually your biggest attribute. They want to be held accountable because they're so freaking busy. And my team is so organized that we say, do this now, do this now, do it. Hey, you missed it. I need it now. You have less than an hour. Let's go. Like we're, we hold them accountable. So like my research was like, oh, we're going to save people time and we're going to like get them better results because they can't do it on their own as well. And, you know, that's, that's, that's the problem with no strategy, you know? So, so like what I learned is, so now I tell people and I'm going to hold your ass accountable and they go, all right, I'm in, let's go. Like I need, I need that, you know? And I'm like, I would have never known that had I not done the research on the consumer, you know? That's awesome. Buck, I know you got to go, man. I appreciate your time and uh, I appreciate you spending some time with our audience here today. This is a very, very valuable conversation. We'll make sure that we link up all the ways that people can connect with you. I hope you have an amazing, amazing rest of your day, brother. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it, Grant. Have a great day. Thank you, dude. Thanks for having me on, brother. Of course. Of course. All right. Okay, dude. See you, buddy. Thank you all for continuing to listen to The Grant Wise Show. This has been another very impactful, impactful episode with the one and only Mr. Buck Wise. I hope you all got a lot of notes. Leave a review of your best takeaways. Shoot me a DM on Instagram if you got any other questions. Would love to continue to chat with you uh, through this. We'll see you on the next episode. Peace. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Grant Wise Show. Please don't forget to subscribe to this channel, leave us a review, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks.